In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Welcome back to our Holy Week retreat. Today is Good Friday, the day when the church commemorates the trial, the crucifixion, and the death of our Lord. As you know well, the crucifix hangs in every Catholic church. It hangs in many of our homes. We start all of our prayers with the sign of the cross. The cross is, in a way, central to the profession of our faith. Our faith is in a faith is a faith in the power of the cross of Christ. So, what do we celebrate on this day? This day which we call good, but which commemorates what seems to be a very great evil. Historically speaking, of course, we profess that Jesus was crucified and died outside of the walls of Jerusalem in Palestine some 2,000 years ago. And that this was not merely the death of a man, because Jesus Christ, while true man, is also truly God. This was the death of the Son of God in his human nature. Now, at Christmas, we celebrate the wonderful mystery of the Incarnation, that the Son of God, the eternal Word of the Father, entered this world and joined the human nature to himself. He assumed a human nature without ceasing to be God. He became one of us. He came out of love for us. He came to be our friend, to live with us. But when we come to Good Friday, one might think that this amazing truth, that God has come into our world to be with us, has taken a very bad turn. God with us is now rejected, rejected by his own people. And not just rejected, but insulted and spat upon and beaten, scourged, humiliated, tortured, and put to death on a cross. In a certain sense, then, the cross on Good Friday presents us with an even deeper mystery than the creche at Christmas. It's the mystery that the most innocent man could be wrongly condemned. The mystery that we human beings could reject God himself. And for the theologian, I think for every Christian, we should also marvel that somehow the eternal Son of God is able to die in his human nature, that he would take even this humiliation on himself. That's a very deep mystery indeed. Why was Jesus killed? Well, we could start by pointing at the Roman soldiers. They're the ones who actually carried out the execution. They received their orders. They carried them out with a kind of deadly efficiency. But we also know from the Gospels that they didn't do this just like any other job that they were given. The Gospels tell us that the soldiers tortured and mocked him before they killed him. They were cruel to him. Then we might think of the high priests, the Sanhedrin, the other leaders of the people in Jerusalem. They accused Jesus of blasphemy for claiming to make himself the Son of God. We could think of Pontius Pilate. He judged Jesus in a trial. He judged him to be innocent and then sentenced him to death anyways. We could think of the crowds who cried out, crucify him. We could think of Judas one of his 12 apostles, a man Jesus had personally called to be one of the pillars of the kingdom of God that Jesus was establishing and who betrayed him for money. We could think even of the other apostles who fled at Jesus' arrest or of Peter who denied him three times. 
In a certain sense, all of these figures, figures from the past, are responsible or we could say had some role in the death of Jesus. But it would be a big mistake if after talking about all of these historical figures, we were to just stop there and leave this in the past. Isn't it true to say that Jesus died for sinners? I mean, that's the heart of the gospel. And if sinners are the cause of his death on the cross, then the list of the guilty is very long indeed. And of course, that list includes you and me. Jesus was weighed down as he carried his cross, not only by a wooden beam, but by your sins, by my sins. Now, that's a very good reason for us to detest our sins and meditating on the passion of Christ, meditating on the sufferings that he went through for us. This is a very good incentive to repent of our sins, to confess them, to do our best to make some reparation for them, to express our sorrow to God for them to do penance for them. Today is a very good day for that. The Universal Church does penance today. We fast on this day of commemorating the Lord's crucifixion. And I hope that you are doing some penance. I hope that that penance is helping you raise your mind to God. That's what it's meant for. And to express your sorrow for your sins, to try and do something to signal how sorry you are and to make up for them. But Jesus did not only die in a certain sense because of sins. He died also because of love, because of his love for you. And that love was the source of a kind of spiritual suffering that he underwent during his passion. That's also helpful to us to remember, because spiritual realities are always greater than physical realities. And so feeling some pain in our bodies, that can be bad. It can be quite bad. But feeling some sorrow in our soul that can sometimes be worse. Where does spiritual suffering come from? Where does the spiritual suffering of Jesus in the Passion come from? Well, it comes from his knowledge of our sins, of our betrayals, of our infidelities. And more than that, it comes from his love for us. You see, Jesus, he knew the Father perfectly. He saw the Father's face, you could say. Being perfect man and also perfect God, he was endowed with a supreme beatific knowledge, a full knowledge of God. And that means that he knows what sinners lose when they commit their sins. He knows just how great God is and also how great the offense of sin is. So Jesus is more aware of the gravity of our sins than we are. Sin has the peculiar feature that it, it deadens us. It numbs us to the reality of the evil that we're doing. And the longer we commit a sin, the more typically we are apt to say, that's not a big deal. But Jesus sees just how big a deal it is. He sees what it means to lose God, who is infinitely good and the only way for us to be happy. Now, Jesus, he sees us losing God by our sins, and he loves us very much. He loves us more than we can possibly imagine. And one feature of love is that it makes us regard the one we love as, in a way, another self. 
You can see this in a human family. A mother who's just given birth to a baby will bring the baby home, and of course, it's wonderful to have the baby, and then the baby begins to cry at night and wake the mother up. Does she wish that the baby would just continue to suffer so that she could get some sleep? No. She wants to comfort her child even though it's not doing much for her at that moment because she regards the good of her child simply as her good. That's what love does for us. We begin to regard those we love as so associated with us that we see their loss in a certain way as ours. Jesus had the most perfect love, the most perfect love for God, and the most perfect love for us. But let's not make it generic, let's make it personal because it is personal. It's absolutely theologically true. Jesus has the most perfect love for you. And so, when he went to the cross, he knew you, and he loved you. Now, he also knew your sins, and he knew what they would mean, what they would mean for you, for others, for the whole world, because our sins always affect not only ourselves, but in fact, they ripple out to affect everyone. Jesus knew these things. And because he saw what leaving you and me and the whole world in sin would mean, he chose the humiliation of the cross. He chose to be mocked and scourged and spat upon and crucified because he loved you. Because he did not want you to be lost. And so if we ask why Jesus was killed in a certain sense, this is the ultimate answer. It was out of love. Love for you. Now, does God want Jesus to die? Does God take any pleasure in death? St. Thomas Aquinas would say no. The Father does not will Jesus' death. Who does will Jesus to die? Well, those who put him to death. The Father wills Jesus to save us, and Jesus wills that too. And it means that he's willing to go all the way to the end. He's willing to lay down his life. He's willing to accept even death for our sake. Not that death would be pleasing to God or somehow would eradicate sin by its own power. No. Rather, the love of Christ does that. We are saved by Christ's love. And this is where we discover how it is that the eternal Son of God, the Word of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, one who in his divine nature is incapable of change or suffering, we discover how it is that he assumed our nature and made himself susceptible to death as man. He did this so that the power of his love, the power of his life, by accepting death from sinners, would swallow up death. This is the amazing truth that we profess, the truth that we wait to celebrate this Easter, that death destroys death. By taking death into himself, you might say, Jesus has forever destroyed its power over us. And it means that those who turn to Christ are saved from death through the power of his cross. Now, that doesn't mean that we will be free of suffering or free of death. Of course, we won't be. And the 
pandemic that we're living through right now is very clear evidence of that. There's still a lot of suffering in the world. But we too can take the sufferings we experience and unite them to the passion of Christ, unite them to Jesus who was willing to die out of love for sinners, out of love for you and for me. We can unite our sufferings and even our death to his. And if we do that, then the power of his life will shine through even the worst suffering. St. Thomas Aquinas says, the more one conforms himself to the passion of Christ, the greater is the pardon and the grace which he gains. He says, being conformed to the passion of Jesus can bring about a complete reformation of our lives. Whoever lives, desires to live perfectly, Aquinas says, need do nothing other than despise what Christ despised on the cross and desire what Christ desired. So, if you seek an example of love, well, greater love than this no one has than to lay down his life for his friends. And this is what Jesus did for you on the cross. If you seek an example of patience, you'll find it in its highest degree on the cross. He shall be led as a sheep to the slaughter and shall be dumb before his shearer and shall not open his mouth. If you seek an example of humility, look upon him who is crucified. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. If you seek an example of obedience, imitate Jesus, the obedient one. For by the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, and so also by the obedience of one man, shall many be made just. If you seek an example of contempt for earthly things, imitate him who is king of kings and lord of lords, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, but who on the cross was stripped naked, ridiculed, crowned with thorns, given to drink vinegar, and put to death. And so the cross is indeed glorious. It is the scepter of Christ the King, the trophy of Christ the victor, the light of teaching of Christ our teacher. Jesus thirsts on the cross. He says, I thirst just before he dies. He thirsts not for some earthly drink. He thirsts with love, with love for you, with love for us, with love for sinners. And so on this Good Friday, come, let us adore him.